God is, his love will reach you and I, no matter where we are, no matter what condition we're in, no matter what we are facing, no matter what we are up against, the love of God will reach out and touch us. So I know we prayed, but I'm going to agree with Pastor Madeline. Can we all just stretch our hands to heaven? Father God, we just want to say thank you. Father, we are so grateful that you were sitting on your mercy seat this morning. We thank you tonight for your amazing graces and your abounding mercies. Father God, we thank you, God, for each person that is here tonight, God. Father God, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Father God, we ask, O oh God, that we come into your presence with the spirit of humbleness. O oh Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you forgive us. Forgive us, God, for all of our sins, O oh God. Father God, knowing and unknowingly, God, premeditated sins, O oh God, habitual sins, O oh God, continuous sins, O oh God. Father, we ask, O oh God, that the blood breaks the yoke of sin tonight, God. Father God, we ask that the blood breaks the local, the cycle tonight, God. Father God, we ask, O oh God, that you forgive us, O oh God. Father God, as you forgive us, O oh God, teach us how to forgive ourselves as well, O oh God. Father God, set us free tonight, God. Father God, we thank you, God, for your glory. God, we know, God, that when your glory is present, oh God, there is no room for nothing else, oh God. So, Father God, we thank you, God, because your glory is in Zion tonight, God. Father God, all sickness must bow down tonight, God. All hurt and habits and hangers must bow down tonight, God. All brokenness must come unto subjection to your glory tonight, God. So, Father God, we thank you tonight, God, for your healing power tonight, God. We thank you for your deliverance power tonight, God. We thank you, God, that you resurrect somebody tonight, God. Father, we thank you, God, that you quicken our spirits, oh God, and bring us back to life tonight, oh God. We thank you, Lord. We come against all sickness, diabetes, oh God, cancer. We come against it in the name of Jesus, oh God. Father God, we are a people that know when we lift up the name of Jesus, it is the name that is above every name, oh God. So no matter what we face, can we just lift up the name of Jesus? Jesus, Jesus, when we call upon that name, everything must come down. So Father God, we ask, oh God, that we are a people, oh God, that you are taking us. We are a people, oh God, who has submitted to your presence, oh God. Father God, we desire to be one with you, God. We desire, Lord, to be in a relationship with you, oh God. We desire, God, to do what is pleasing in your eyes, oh God. We desire, God, to seek your will for our lives, oh God. We desire, God, a touch of your grace. Touch us tonight, Lord. Lord, Father God, I ask, oh God, that I decrease that you may increase, God. Father God, I am submitted to your presence, O oh God. Father God, have your way tonight, Lord. Lord, I am your humble servant, God. And Father God, I ask, O oh God, that you touch any heart that is heavy tonight, God. Father God, we come against, God, heavy hearts, O oh God. Father God, we come against, O oh God, heavy minds, O oh God. Father God, Father, lighten the load tonight, Lord. Lord, we need you tonight, Lord. We need a touch from you tonight, God. Father, you are already present, O oh God. Now, God, increase our expectation tonight, God. Increase our expectation, oh God. Increase our expectation, oh God. Father God, we can't do it without you, Father God. Father God, we thank you. Oh Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We can't thank you enough, oh God. Father God, you're so worthy, God. You're worthy of our yes, oh Lord. You're worthy of our hallelujah. You're worthy of our bless your name. You're worthy of us lifting you up. You're worthy of us, oh God. And Father God, I just ask, oh God, that you hit every target, God. Father God, I ask, oh God, that every heart has been prepared for your word, oh God. And Father God, I ask God that you just take the hymn. Jesus, take the will. Lord, we ask and we lift you up. We usher this prayer into the heavens. If you agree with this prayer, please say amen. 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 I want to uh, give honor to God, who is my life. And I would like to give honor to Pastor Lawrence and the Shells peoples, the senior pastors of this house. Can we give honor, please? The angels of this house. And before I press any further, I would like to acknowledge um, my good thing. The one who has stood by my side through the thick and the thin, through the ups and the downs. 
and I'm grateful. I wasn't always grateful. I had to learn to be grateful. I thank God that I understand that marriage is a gift. And I've learned to appreciate the gift. And I've learned to appreciate the gift within the gift. Because every good and perfect gift, it comes from God. So I thank you to my beautiful wife of 21 years, Chantella. I'm going to go ahead and read the uh, scripture reading for tonight. It's one scripture, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. It is a very familiar portion of scripture. If you all have it, say amen. amen. And it reads, if my people, that's us, who are called by my name, God knows us all by name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, turn from sin, turn from the wrongdoing, turn from the backsliding, turn from the backbiting, turn away, turn away. Then will I hear from heaven. We all want God to hear. And I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, and most importantly, our doing of the word. You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I just want to thank God for Pastor Lawrence. Um, I know he has impacted each and every one of our lives in so many ways. And what I love most about Pastor is he deal with each and every one of us differently. He'll deal with us the way we need to be dealt with. And that's beautiful because no two people are the same or alike. No two people are going through the same circumstance or situation. So I just thank God for the for the training. And I know I came in a certain type of way. And my pastor met me right in my need. And I give God the glory that he didn't give up on me. Amen. We are living in a time where it is so important for each and every one of us to be in the will of God. There is no room for wasting time because we never know what tomorrow holds. We have to always remember time does not stand still for no one. Time is a very precious commodity. Times have changed. Seasons have come and gone. But one thing for sure, the word of God never changes. The word of God never fails. The word of God is unblemished. It is untainted. It has been tried. It has been tested. And it has been found to be true. Can I get an amen? amen? The time is now to get it right. There is no time to be in denial. We are running out of time. God is warning us and reassuring us at the same time. God will send judgment into your life to steer you and I back to him. Warning. This leads me to point number one. And by the way, the title of this sermon tonight is The Time Is Now. Point number one, time is running out. The children of Israel were running out of time. They were free from Pharaoh by God, but yet they were still in prison at their own hand. How many know that when we can desire something and not be ready for it? We can pray for something and not be ready for what we are praying for. We can ask God to step into our life, step into a situation, change a situation, move a situation. But when God step in to do what we have asked God to do, pray for God to do, we stay stuck in the past. The children of Israel said they wanted to be free, 
But when it came down to it, their mind didn't line up with their hearts. They cried out to the God. And God seen their cry. But when God came to deliver, they did not really want to be free. It's a bad thing when your heart does not line up with what you ask for. It's a dangerous territory. This is a bad formula for self-destruction. The Israelites started out on a journey that was supposed to last for how many days? Eleven days. And the story goes on to say that it took 40 years. Even though it took 40 years, for an 11-day journey, they still never ended up where they were supposed to go. So I pose a question tonight. We have asked God to set us free. We have asked God to deliver us, restore us, renew our minds, renew our life. We have asked God to do these things, but are we still wondering? Are we still trying to go back to what God set us free from? Are we still trying to go back to our past? Are we still trying to go back to the people who were hurting us and mishandling us? Are we still trying to go back into that place? An 11-day journey. With your spiritual imagination, picture that. you going somewhere, you taking a trip, you know it takes one hour, one day, one week, one month, one year, and it turned out to Four hours, four days, four weeks, four months, four years, 40 years, and you still never make it, even though you know where you were going. Some people right now are spinning in a circle because they can't trust the process. They want to be in control. They will not change their mindset. They are in a cycle, and a cycle must be broken. I stopped by to tell you tonight, time is running out. We have been wandering in the wilderness too long. We have been wandering around in life too long. There are some places that we need to go in life that we can't get ourselves there. God led the Israelites out of Egypt, and God wanted to lead the Israelites into the promised land. The Bible tells us to set your mind on things above and not of the earth. See, there are some things in some places that we are trying to go that you can't go on your own. You have to be led by God. And if you do not allow God to lead you into that place, you will never make it, even though it is so close, yet it is so far away. We have been wandering in the wilderness too long. And when we are wandering in the wilderness, we are trying to get to a place on our own. Even though we know the way. But this place that is purpose for you, this place that has been ordained for you, this place that has been predestined for you, this place that has been prepared for you, this place that is your place of destiny, this place, the land of the milk and honey, you cannot enter into that place unless you allow God to order your steps. It is so close, yet so far away. We have to look to God to come out of what we're in. This is what God is trying to do. And then this is what he is trying to do today. God wants to lead us. Do we understand that? Say la. Right there. <clears throat> I want everybody to just think for every vision that God has given them. And we are in a ministry that we teach people what they are called to do in life. This is a ministry that builds the lives of the people. And once you find out what you are purpose to do, then you have to be led there by God. You have to be led in that place by God. And some of us might be trying to figure it out. Why can't I get there? Why haven't I made it? Why am I not doing what God has called me to do? And the reason why we have to allow God to lead us in that place. 
Look at your neighbor and tell them time is running out. God gave the Israelites what they asked for. He set them free. Some of us ask God for forgiveness. He gives it to us, and we go and repeat the same thing. Some of us ask God to break the yoke off our life. He breaks the yoke, and we go back and we repeat the same thing. Some of us, we ask God to get people away from us that are toxic to our lives, and when he gets them away, clear the path, we go back and we bring them back into our lives. Some of us have asked God to break habits and addictions off of our lives. When God destroys that yoke, we go back and we yoke back up with that yoke. Why do we do that? We try to hold on to the very thing that we ask God to break off our lives. Time is running out. Our mind has to agree with our hearts. It's real simple. The antidote is trust God and live by the word of God. Trust God and allow yourself to walk in the will of God. Trust God and walk in the ways of God. But the only way we can understand the will of God, the word of God, the ways of God, we have to come right here and get in the word of God. We can't figure this out. This is something that nobody can't tell us. We have to get it for ourselves. Do we all understand that we have to get this word in our life for ourselves? Yes, Pastor is always talking about flipping the pages and growing in the dark. And believe it or not, we can't see you, but we can see you. We know who growing in the dark because it's going to show up on your life. We know who flipping the pages. You don't have to quote a scripture to flip the pages. You don't have to do that there. But guess what? When you flipping these pages, you don't have to tell nobody because when you show up, God steps in. Amen? You have to relinquish all your rights of being in control. Control is a very stealth spirit. Stealth, it hides itself from us. It hides itself from the one who says, I'm not a control freak. It hides itself from the person that says, I'm, I'm an open-minded person. It hides itself. So you have to humble yourself and go to God and say, Lord, can you show me if I'm a person that likes to be in control? I know because I was one that used to like to be in control. I used to like to hide my being in control. Come on now, somebody. You can't hide from nobody. You can try to hide from yourself. And don't nobody know you like you. The children of Israel ran out of time because they didn't trust God. It cost them. They never made it to purpose. When you never look to God, the one who you pray to to set you free, you knew how to seek his face, get in his presence, and then when he did what you asked him to do, he did what you pleaded for him to do, he did what you called on him to do, when he did it, you started to wonder. All you had to do was keep your eyes on the Lord. When Peter stepped out the boat, before he stepped out the boat, he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. It's me. Come. He stepped out of the boat. He had his eyes on the Lord. When we prayed to God to set us free from what we were yoked up with when we were in bondage, we had our minds set on the Lord. He set us free. But when he set us free, when he broke the chains and the shackles off your life, when he took you out of bondage, took you out of captivity, took captivity captive and set you free and let you make a, your own decision with no pressure on your life, what did we do? Go back. Peter stepped out of the boat and he was on water. He stepped out of the familiar into the 
unfamiliar. He did something that no man had ever done before. But what he did was had his eyes on the Lord. It's real simple. If we keep our mind and our heart set on God, when we step out when he call us to him, we can walk on water. When we step out when he call us to him, we can do the unknown. When we step out and he call us to him, we can walk in that place of purpose. When we step out and he call us to him, keep your eyes on the Lord. Can we keep our eyes on the Lord? Because when he say, come, will you be ready? When he says, come, will you obey? When he says, come, will you be committed? When he says, come, will you stay focused? When he said, come, will you fix your heart and your mind on the Lord? Because he's going to say, come. Understand that God has to be Lord in your life. God don't want to just be part of your life. He wants to be Lord. When we give our life to Christ, that's an introduction. I used to think and used to be around people that thought that was enough. But we need more than that. When you give your life to Christ, when you say, here I am, Lord, and he gives you the gift of salvation, then you have that love for God where you don't want to listen to no wrong music. You don't want to be around certain type of people. You don't want to go certain places. Remember when you first gave your life to Christ. Remember when he was really your true love. But guess what? Sometimes we wander away. Sometimes we drift away. Sometimes we get away. And then that's when he has to reel us back in. But why can't we just stay in that place of pursuing God, chasing God, instead of him putting pressure on our lives, instead of him putting a squeeze on our lives? The children of Israel ran out of time. They didn't trust God. It cost them. Are we going to let us wandering in the wilderness, us wandering in life, us wandering or trying to figure this out, us wandering and wanting to do this our way, us wandering and can't nobody tell me what to do, us wandering is I'm too grown, us wandering. Are we going to allow ourselves to continue to wonder? in the wilderness because if you don't make it that dream that you dream if it never manifests the vision that God gave you if it never manifests that idea that God gave you if it never manifests perhaps you and I are wondering stuck for 40 years in the process for 40 years, going through the motion for 40 years, not willing to look at the Father for 40 years, fed them from manna from on high for 40 years, and yet they could not bow their hearts to God. Once you find out what your life purpose is, as Minister Lanny taught us, it is a gift. But when you find out what you're called to do, you are to serve that gift to the world. But you can't serve that gift if you never look to God. Could you imagine God made you a promise and you were so close, yet so far from possessing it because of the choices that we make? The decisions that we make, we are running out of time. Look at your neighbor again and tell them time is running out. Amen. Point number two. Don't wrestle with the enemy. There are things we should know. God knows our name, but guess what? The enemy knows your name too. God gave us a purpose. The enemy knows that. God has a plan for us. The enemy knows that. God loves us. And guess what? The enemy knows that. If there anybody in here that you are really trying to strive to live right, you are trying to strive to live for God. 
you are trying to strive to do things the way God intended you, but on every turn and on every front, you are being fought by the enemy. The enemy knows your purpose. Are we going to continue to help the enemy stop us, or are we going to size up with God and let us take us on in? See, you on one side or the other. Either we're going to walk with God and walk into purpose, or we're going to stand with the enemy and stay down in loader bar. Everybody knows the most, one of the infamous scriptures that the enemy has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. He got a mission. And when he come, he coming to kill it. And if he can't kill it, he going to keep coming. He coming to steal. And if he can't steal it after he tried to kill it, he's going to keep coming. And now he's going to try to destroy it. He is going to keep coming after us. So why are we going to continue or when are we going to break the cycle of teaming up with the enemy to stop what God has called for? God fearfully and wonderfully made us. He created us in his image and his likeness. The enemy makes it his business to get to know all about us so he can kill. And if he don't kill you, he coming after the next generation. And then he try to steal. If he don't steal it from you, he want to steal it from the seed. And then he wants to destroy. And if he don't destroy you, he wants to destroy your offspring. And, and what are we going to do about that? That's a warning. The enemy is not concerned if we are out of the will of God. So if we are not doing what we are supposed to do, if we're not living by the word of God, if we're not standing on the word of God when temptation come, when the trials come, when the circumstances arise, when the situations come, if we don't stand on the word, the enemy is not worried about us. The moment we tell God, yes, here comes the enemy. But guess what? God reminds us in his word that he is with us. He promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Be careful who you get involved with because the enemy used people too. Without God, man cannot, and without man, God will not. It, it, the same thing apply for the enemy. He uses people to distract us. He uses people to come into our lives and take us off course to derail us from what we are called to do. Keep in mind what his job is. I'm talking to sisters and brothers. You have to understand that everything that look good is not good. Everything that sounds good is not good. Everything that glitter is not gold. Be sure you are consulting with God through prayer and fasting before you allow people into your lives. Does anybody have time to waste time? Can I get a hand up? Nobody has time to waste time. So, when you meet somebody, you have to take that to God in prayer and ask God, why is this person coming into my life? And ask God, should I allow this person into my life? And if you can't hear from God, you wait on God. You wait in God. If that person is continues to try to pursue you, you have to use godly wisdom to make them hold up, to make them wait, to make them be patient for whatever type of relationship it is. If you are in right standing with God, the Holy Spirit will give you discernment. You know one of the funniest things that people do this day and time? Subliminal messages. If you got discernment, then when somebody sends a subliminal message, then the person that's sending the message, the message can be coded. And sometimes... We send subliminal messages really to help people. And sometimes we send subliminal messages because we won't face people. But for whatever reason, we send a subliminal message, then I'm pretty sure that person that you're sending it to, they got the message because you didn't put their name in the message. I'm going to leave that alone. We will be tempted 
and we will be tested. We know when Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, it says that in Luke 4 that Jesus was full of the Spirit. Now, this, I've been reading, this is, my, this is my favorite, this is my honeycomb of the Bible, Luke 4. I learned that from Mother Margaret. And Luke 4 says Jesus was full of the Spirit. I ran over that, like, just all the time. But think about this bottle of water. This bottle of water right now, some of us going to look at this as half empty, and some of us is going to look at it as half full because we all have different mindsets. But my point here is, if this bottle of water is full of water, then there's no room for nothing else. Jesus was full of the Spirit when he went into the wilderness. So when you go into a wilderness situation, when you go into something that you don't know what the outcome is going to be, you have to get in the spirit and you have to be full of the spirit. So when the enemy comes, when the enemy comes to attack, when the enemy comes to bring distress, when the enemy comes to bring discontent, when you are full of the spirit, you will not rely on the flesh because the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. You have to trust God when you're in a situation. So when you step into the wilderness and you are full of the Spirit, when the enemy comes to tempt you, the Bible says that God with temptation always provides a way of escape. The Bible says that when the enemy tempted Jesus, I know he tempted him more than three times, but it was three recorded times in Scripture. He says that can you turn this bread, this stone into bread? And Jesus said, it is written. When the enemy comes into your life to tempt you, you have to be able to tell the enemy, him or her, it is written. You have to say to it, it is written. You have to say to the circumstance, it is written. To the situation, it is written. And the only way you're going to know what is written is you have to get in the written word. Amen? It is written. Sometimes we can be so far from the truth and not even know it. That's the truth right there. How close to the truth are you? Are you passing by the truth? Are you sleeping by the truth? Or are you getting in the truth? The only way you can be free is you get in this word. It is written. It is written. Real simple. But we have to know what is written. We have to search for what is written. We have to be hungry for what is written. We have to pursue what is written. We have to get in the dark for what is written. We have to get on our knees for what is written. We have to get that rhema for what is written. It is written. If we don't get in the word, the enemy will wreak havoc in our lives. We have no defense. I don't want to take a knife to the gunfight. I want to take a word to the gunfight. It is written, Jesus was full of the Spirit. Woo! So when the enemy came, he didn't tell the enemy or give him a piece of his mind. The enemy questioned his identity, questioned his character, offered them things, and every time, no matter what the enemy did, it is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So, going forth, I declare the decree that no matter who we are, that going forth, that we're going to get in this word like never before. So when the enemy comes into our life to attack, we will be able to say it is written. When the enemy comes in our life to bring havoc, we will be able to say it is written. When the enemy comes in our life to mess things up, we will be able to say it is written. When the enemy try to make us live in our past, we will be able to say it is written. When the enemy will try to make us uh, just, just get hung up on habits, we will say it is written. When the enemy comes into your life and tries to be, keep you bound, to whatever had you yoked up, you and I will be able to say, it is written. Thank you, Lord. Not what I want to say. What the Word says. Not what somebody told me. What the Word said. Not what I heard. What the Word said. Not what I seen what the word said. You got to stand on that word, believe in that word, hold to that word. You got to keep that word. You got to walk in that word. Whatever the word is, you got to hold to the word. Let the word keep you. 
when the enemy come at you with situations and circumstances they, that you know are not from God, tell them it is written. That's the antidote that our Lord gave us to stand up against the enemy. Now, here we go. Some things we can't give the enemy credit for. Some things we can't blame on the enemy. Everything is not the enemy's fault. The greatest enemy is the enemy within. Some people wrestle with God. Some people wrestle with men. But a lot of us wrestle with self and don't even realize it. Are we in self-denial or that we wrestling with self? Who are you truly wrestling with today? The enemy within will tear you apart. The enemy within will have you focus on the external. Focus on what's happening. Keep you in isolation. The enemy within will have you and I full of pride. The enemy within will cause you to be unforgiving. We are believers. Or we're striving to be for believers. When somebody wrong us, say something to mishandle us, mistreat us. As a believer, they are trying to draw you out of character to really see if you're really a believer, to really see if you can really practice what you preach, to really, to really see if you can really stand on that same word that you've been trying to get them to. So when they come to draw you out, after they have mishandled you, even though you know they talked about you, even though when they walk by you, they give you, a, you feel that vibe. Sometimes you just feel that vibe. They only have to look a certain type of way. Can you still handle them with love? Can you still handle them with care? Even though they mishandled you, you still love them back. Love endures everything. Nothing can stand in the presence of God's love because you know that when they mistreat you, mishandle you, when you step on the scene, you want them to see the God in you and not you in God. It is a difference. Can I talk about God or can people see the God in me? It is a difference. It's more that they see the God in you than you in God. You and God is you going to church. You and God is you getting down on the altar. You and God is you quoting scriptures. But when they see the God in you, when they mishandle you, you still say, I'm sorry, can I help you? When they walk by you, when you come around again, you say, hey, sister, how you doing? That's what the God in you will do. That's what they need to see. The God in you must supersede the you in God. Did everybody get that? Amen. God is so good. The enemy within will cause you and I to live with regret. The enemy within will cause you and I to live in a place of shame. The enemy within will tell you you are not good enough and have you been second-guessing yourself. That's what the enemy within, that's you talking to yourself. That's you having that conversation with yourself. A man left to himself is doomed for destruction. Whatever you're telling yourself, take that to God. And make sure what you're telling yourself is in alignment and lining up with the word of God. Today I have a message for all the enemies within because it is written that man, he shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When you know who you are in God, you can rebuke. You can denounce. You can cast out. You can bind things up and lock things up in the power of the Holy Ghost. When you know who you are, you have to know who you are to denounce the stronghold over isolation. You have to know who you are to bind up the spirit of pride. You have to know who you are to rebuke the spirit of unforgiveness, the spirit of bitterness, that sour face, that nasty attitude. You have to know who you are so when you see that thing, you can call it out. And when you call it out, you send it back to where it came, for, to the pits of hell. 
when you know who you are, you can stand up and say, devil, you is a liar. Only when you know who you are and whose you are. When you know who you are, you should be rebuking when things are out of order. When you know who you are, you should be denouncing when things are not going your way. When you know who you are and people are out of line, you got to cast some things out. When you know who you are and your kids are getting off course, you got to bind some things up in the name of Jesus. You have that right as a believer. You have that authority as a believer. And guess what? The enemy is not a respecter of people who are nice, people who are silent. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So the enemy only respects power. The enemy respects authority. You have to walk in authority. You have to walk in power. When you want the enemy to get back, you can't say get back. You got to step up and come with power. You got to step up and rebuke their devourer. Put him on notice. You got to serve an eviction notice to the enemy. You got to foreclose on the enemy. You got to cancel the assignments. You got to talk to the enemy like that. Because when you get foreclosed, it's time to go. When you get evicted, it's time to go. When you repo, it's time to go. Serve the notice. Serve the notice to the enemy. You got to go. Only when you know who you are can you talk like that. Only when you know who you are can you speak like that. Only when you know who you are can you talk and your talk come in power. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Thank you, Lord. This leads me to point number three. Pastor, I always say whatever's on your mind is leading you. Pastor, I always say whoever gets the mind gets the life. We are in a time where prayer is a must. We are in a time now where prayer must be fervent. Ah, you, might, you got to have a passion to pray. You have to have a desire to pray. You have to have a will and a want to pray. You have to know that no matter what's going on, you have to have time set aside to pray. You have to have that time. When the, when the apostles asked Jesus to teach us something, they didn't ask him to teach us how to preach. They didn't say teach us how to evangelize. They didn't say teach me how to be an apostle. All they asked me to do was say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Have that talk with Jesus. We, may, we need to make sure our children are praying to Abba Father. Even if they can't get a prayer, I'll just tell them to say, Abba Father. Because when they say Abba Father, they're coming into his presence. When they say Abba Father, they are inviting them in. Oh, we need to get in that place with our children and train them how to pray. And when they keep doing it repetitiously, when they keep doing it repeatedly, when they keep doing it continuously, when they do it perpetually, teach them how to pray. And they, their faith will build, their confidence will build. But it starts with us, and we have to be it first. If they don't see us praying, then they won't pray. If they don't see us praying, they don't have a model to follow. Our kids listen to more about what we do than what we say. Listen, our kids listen by more than what we do than what we say. If I say, sit down, they might stand up. But if I sit down, they're going to sit down. I didn't say a thing. Abba, an Aramic word that means father, it expresses affection. Confidence and trust it signifies a close intimate relationship with the Father. I mean, my wife is a true worshiper. I used to like to praise. I used to get, I like to get, when my wife used to worship, it used to bring me down. But I didn't understand. But well, she just kept worshiping. And I, and I kept coming down. But when I learned how she was really entering into the presence, Oh, my God. I started worshiping with her. Yeah. 
going to tell a little joke right quick and I'm going to press on because we press for time. I've been on this spiritual pilgrimage for about seven years now. And I, didn't, I remember the first time I got the Bible, I was like, how am I going to learn this here? But you know what I did? Like double dutch, I just got in. It, it's no right way. You just got to get in. When you want to learn how to pray, you just, you just get in. When you want to know how to stay in his will, you just get in. When you want to know his word, you just get in. So I was watching my wife. She used to pray in the bathroom, in the shower, being respectful. I'm trying to sleep. Two years that went away. One, one day she came and got in the bed. I'm trying to sleep. I'm like, but what can you say to that? I remember I tried, and I'm going to push on. I remember I tried to pick an argument with my wife. She don't like to argue. She started, I tried to pick an argument. Ekele Lolobosa. Oh, my God. How can I stand up against that? I bowed. I tapped out. And I did it again. And I did it again. I stopped trying to argue. She put a word on it. It is written. That's the truth, y'all. We're in a time where there's a clarion call for major prayer. Could you imagine if I was a journalist and if I was on the job, the first thing I'd do is write a story and a headline to read, extra, extra, read all about it, spread the word of God and go out and shout it. That's what the headline will read. And I'll just walk it out. God said that my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wickedness. I will forgive their sin. I will heal from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. We need God to do things for us. Can we go ahead and stand to our feet? And God gave a, a process pattern how to be healed. You cannot get the healing if you pray and try to turn away. It says humble yourself. When you and I humble ourselves, we take a look at that man or that woman in the mirror. And we push everything aside. And we ask God to show me, me. We know the area in our lives that don't align with the word of God. We know the area in our lives that we need to bring to God. But will we really bring that area to God? Will we really humble ourselves? You guys are looking at, and ladies, a guy that was very arrogant. God had to break and crush my will. And I got up and I thought I was ready and I was not ready. He had to break me again, crush me again. And I got up and I thought I was ready and I was not ready. So he had to break me again, crush me again. When I got up this time, I was humble. If my people... God is calling us by name. God wants to heal our life, heal our marriages, heal our relationships with our children, heal our desires of our heart. We are hurting from the desires of our heart because we're not attaining them. That hurts. But you cannot obtain it. It will continue to hurt until you humble yourself. It will continue to be painful when you see other people living out their life dreams until you humble yourself. You cannot use a person to your left or to your right as a measuring stick. You have to use yourself because you and I are the only ones that are holding us back. If my people 
who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Bring it to God. Lay it on the altar. Plead your cause. Plead your case to God. And then he said to seek my face. That means that get in his presence. That means that, Lord, I'm nothing without you. We cannot come into his presence in pride. We, can't, we can come in his presence in pride, but will you lay it down? 